now, would you turn with me to Mark? We're going to start in Mark chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse 21. When they had broken through, when these four men had broken through, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but what we're going to talk about seems crazy. When we start talking about a spiritual battle, and Jesus, you're going to read in just a moment, is going to cast out a demon in the middle of the church service, this spiritual battle seems really crazy to even talk about because it's invisible until you see it. Until you actually see it. Uh, Jesus is going to be walking around the nation and, and preaching around there. And there's going to be a leper that walks up to him and just ask him. He's just asking, him, would you heal me? And God says, we have not because we ask not. And if we'll just ask him, if we have the word of God living in our hearts, if we'll just ask him, we'll get it. Now that seems crazy that, that we can just ask an invisible God, an invisible Father, Lord, would you do this for me? Would you stop this? Would you start this for me? And expect to get an answer. And that seems nuts, crazy, until you see it happen. And when you see it happen, it's amazing, it's miraculous. Jesus goes to Peter's house and his mother-in-law is sick. We're going to read about this. And they just walked over and they said, she's sick, could you heal her? And he said, why, yeah. And so he walked over to her and he slapped her in the face twice and he laid his hand up on her head and he jerked her out of bed. And he said, be healed! No, he didn't. He walked over and he just touched her hand and picked her up and she was well. Just as she came up, she was well. Now that seems crazy that that kind of power is at our fingertips that we could just ask and get it. That seems crazy until you see it. Now listen to this hymn. We used to sing this hymn. All the churches used to sing this hymn. It's written by William Poole. Have you prayed it through? And that's really what we're going to be talking about today is, is prayer. And pray until we finish. Pray until we get an answer and not stopping. Have you prayed it through? Have you prayed all night till the break of day and the morning light drove the dark away? Did you linger there till the morning dew in prevailing prayer? Did you pray it through? Did you pray it through till the answer came? There's a promise true for your faith to claim. At the time of prayer, Jesus waits for you. Did you meet him there? Did you pray it through? As the master prayed in the garden alone, let your prayer be made to the Father's throne. If you seek his will, he will answer you. Are you trusting still? Have you prayed it through? Did you pray till the answer came? Did you plead in the Savior's name? Have you prayed all night till the morning light? Did you pray till the answer came? Would you bow with me? Let's ask God's blessing on this. Father, you are almighty God. There is none like you. You are the creator, God. You're our father and our friend. And yet, you sit on the throne of the universe judging righteously. You are righteousness. You are truth. You are salvation. And you are eternity. There's none like you. Lord Jesus, our Savior, who rose from the dead, is coming back to get us. There's none like you our friend and our Savior and our God. And Holy Spirit who indwells us and lives in us until Jesus comes back, you are God, holy, 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 our God three in one, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty El Shaddai. Lord, we ask you that you'd be here with us today and we ask you for your help. We pray that you turn our eyes and our hearts towards you today as we study your word and we thank you for that. Praise the name of God in Christ's name, amen. Now, one of the things about prayer is it's fellowship with God. As we ask Him and as we talk to Him, we get to be fellowshipping with Him. So I want you to stand up right now. As we study prayer, as we talk about prayer, it's not just about asking, it's also about fellowship. And I want you to do this, I want you to practice. You don't have to, you don't have to hold it, just practice it. 
you're not succeeding. Practice it one more time. Okay. Now, I want you to go around this church for just a minute. This is part of the sermon on prayer. Fellowship with each other and do this to each other. And if you shake hands, shake hands. If you don't, bump elbows, go. Welcome, guys. If you'll find a seat. Jesus is doing. Now, we want to know what Jesus is doing around us today because it's crazy stuff, man. There's some wild stuff going on. It's been a long time since we've been 110 in Amarillo, Texas. The record is 111. We missed it by two degrees yesterday. There's some crazy stuff going on. Watching what Jesus is doing, point number one. I'm in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 21. When they went into Capernaum, immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he taught. So he's going to go into church. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Leave us alone. Leave us alone. We've got church going the way we want it to. Leave us alone. Now you'll notice that came from the devil. <laughs> We don't want to change anything. Just leave us alone, right in the middle of church. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. It's not hard to see what God is doing. Immediately his fame spread throughout all of Galilee. Now what he's doing is he's just preaching in church. He's just in the local synagogue. He's just in the local church. And he's trying to give a message. And this guy stands up in the middle and he says, We don't want what you've got. We like what we've got. Leave us alone. Now what did they have? That's the question you got to ask yourself. What, what kind of church did they have? Well, they had a church there where a guy who was demon-possessed was comfortable in the pew. Can you hear me? You're going to have to go help her. She cannot just let my picture go and go help her get her turned on. They won't be able to hear you. Let's do this. Oh, they really can't hear me without it. You just cannot hear. <laughs> okay, never mind. What kind of church service could you be having where the devil is comfortable living in one of, of the people sitting in the service? And Jesus said, we're going to have to change this. We're going to have to change what's going on inside the church. And so Jesus starts working inside the church in a very spiritual and powerful way. And he casts out that demon and he says, let's have church together. And they said, Wow. This is really unique, a man that speaks with authority. And so watching what God does as he's working around us today in our society, what he's working in first is the church. It's not, a, it's not an accident that in the church, the very first thing that the scripture says as he's working here in Mark is he starts with the church. And so what you're seeing going on around us today is for the church. But then he goes on. Then he says in verse 29, now, as soon as they come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. This is going to be Peter's house. Now you're going to see God work in the home. Not only is he going to work in the church, he's going to work in the home. Watch what God's doing around you. You know, what we're doing now is we're working from the home. Well, here's Jesus working from the home. He goes in the home, and they say, 
Simon, your mother-in-law's sick. Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her once. And so he came, and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. So the second thing you're going to see is you watch Jesus working. The first thing we're going to see is he works in the church. So what's he doing today? He's working in the church. He's changing things. We've got church services all over the United States where we're very comfortable, but God's not. He said, I'm not comfortable in a church where the devil is comfortable. We're going to have to change some things inside the church. And so we're watching what he's doing as he goes through our nation. And the first thing, it's it's for the church. But the second thing is for, it's for the home. We're starting, if you'll see what God's doing, we're starting to actually come back home. We're starting to work from the home. It looks like at least 50% of them aren't going back because of the overhead. Where they can get rid of the overhead, they can work from the home. And now, all of a sudden, God's putting his people back into the home. Watch what God's doing in this pandemic. And by the way, it was downgraded this weekend. It's no longer a pandemic. Are you picking that up? They're not, they're not announcing it, but it's going down, 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 down. Things are getting better. They would not have you believe that, but it's been, it's been downgraded from the pandemic. Now God's working in the home, and he's changing things in the home. He's bringing us back to our homes. He's bringing us back to our kids. Watch what Jesus is doing. Starting in verse 32, at evening when the sun had set, they brought him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. He did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. We're going to come back to verse 35 in just a moment. He went out and he prayed. But verse 38, he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. He was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and he was casting out demons. A leper came to him, imploring him, asking him, kneeling down to him, and saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I'm willing to be cleansed. As soon as he spoke, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was clean. And here you see Jesus working in the nation. Now he's walking around to all the churches of the nation of Israel. First, he started with the church. Next thing, he started in the home. And now he's in the nation, and he's walking around the nation, and he's just answering prayers from the people. And a leper comes up and he says, would you heal me? That's all it took. And Jesus said, yes, and heal me. That's all it took. So you've got Jesus. You see Jesus working in the church. You see Jesus working in the home. You see Jesus working in the nation. And that's what's going on right now. You can see God working as he moves around us. But I want to go back to verse 35. Jesus went out a great while before day, and he prayed. And where all the power is coming from is his prayer. Now watch this, because Jesus is God himself. Why would Jesus, why would God need to pray? Because he had all the power he needed, and he was already God. So what's he doing, and what's he telling us when he goes out a great while before day, and he just spends some time praying? What good did that do? What's he showing us? And here it is. He's showing us that the Holy Spirit of God moves when we pray. Jesus was God, yes. But Jesus wanted the Holy Spirit to be working in these other people. He wanted the Holy Spirit to be working in the home. He wanted the Holy Spirit to be working in the church. He wanted the Holy Spirit to be working in the nation. And the only way that's going to happen is when he prays. And so as he prays, the Holy Spirit of God starts to move in all of those locations, in all of those places. And he's teaching us something. If God himself needed to pray for the moving of the Holy Spirit, guess what we need to do? We've got to learn how to pray because we're for sure not God. And by the way, irregardless of what Mr. Lemon says, Jesus was perfect mm-hmm. and sinless. I can take a haunt for that. <laughs> Watch what God does as his people start to pray. As he starts to pray, you can see the power of God. And and it says the Spirit of God is moving over the nation of Israel. And they're going, wow, what authority is this? 
And it's because of Jesus' prayers, even though he's God and he's perfect. He's showing us what we have to do. I'm going to go back and talk to Inside Group. Thank you. Go with me to chapter 2. Thank you very much. I told you in on the middle of all this mess, we're not going to be formal. We're completely informal, but we're going to study the Word of God and ask God to be here. That's as informal as I can get right there. Turn with me to Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now, point number one, watch what God is doing around us. Watch, because he's doing marvelous things around us, and he's moving mightily. But in chapter 2, verse 1, again he entered into Capernaum. After some days, and he was heard that he, it was heard that he was in the house. Which house? Peter's house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, no, not even near the door. So the house is so full... They can't take anymore, and now they're outside around the doors, peering to look in, trying to strain in to hear, and they're all across out at the front door. Now watch what Jesus does. Verse 2, at the end of verse 2, he preaches the word to them. That brings us to point number 2. And I don't need to belabor this point because you already know it and you already believe it, but he preached the word of God. Now what's important, he'd been out in the nation, He'd been out in the church, he'd been out in the home, and, and it's moving, he's moving powerfully, the Holy Spirit is moving around. He comes back home, and what does he do? He goes into the house. He's working from the home. He goes into the house, and what does he do? He preaches the Word of God. Why is it so important, this Word of God? Why is it going to be important for the nation, and why is it going to be important for our prayers? Because the Word of God tells us who Jesus is. The Word of God tells us who the Father is. The Word of God tells us who the Holy Spirit is, our God three in one. And it tells us how He works and how He operates. It gives His modus operandi. tells us exactly how He works and how He operates. And we need to know this. It shows us that Jesus is God. But it also shows us that the Holy Spirit is God. And it teaches us how to pray and how to access God's power. And they said, this is a message with authority. What I say in my words carry no authority. But when I teach and preach the word of God, that is authority. And the word of God is what we need and what this nation needs. And everything that we do is based on the word of God. And if it's not, it carries no authority. There is a movement, listen carefully, there's a movement moving across our campuses today that says it's the Holy Spirit of God moving. And they're gathering into groups in private rooms on the campuses and off campuses, and they're starting to bark like dogs and quack like ducks. And they say the Holy Spirit has come upon us. Now, this, is a, this isn't, I'm not making a joke here. This is a movement that's spreading across the United States as I speak in the campuses. Now, some of our churches... Our more radical church has already had this going on in there. But this is a movement that's moving across our campuses. And they're gathering together and barking like dogs, quacking like ducks, and saying that the Holy Spirit of God has come upon them. That's not in the Word of God. Nowhere do I read the apostles barked. Peter said some dumb things. But he never barked and he never quacked. We need the Word of God. It tells you exactly how the Holy Spirit operates. And if it's not in there, it's not true. Now listen carefully. Somebody tells you the Holy Spirit has come to our place. If it's not in the Bible, it's not real. So that's why Jesus, in the middle of this great revival that's taking place in Israel, he stands at the home and he preaches. It says he preached the word of God. Would you underline it? He preached the word to them. Underline it. This is our anchor. 
This is what's necessary. It's going to teach us how to pray. In just a moment, we're going to study about prayer. We're going to look at the power of prayer. We're going to look at the Holy Spirit of God in prayer. But what anchors us and what tells us the truth about how the Holy Spirit works and the power of God is found right here in verse 2. And he preached the word to them. The Bible is absolutely necessary in our prayer time. It's absolutely necessary in our worship time. And it is the power of God, but don't you get mixed up about what the power of God is and what the power of God does. He says in Acts 1.8, You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. You shall be my... The power of God is to tell other people about Christ. The power of God is to see our nation come to Christ. The power of God is to see people come back to him to see homes healed lives that are broken put back together that's the power of God the power of God is the word of God through love and so he preached the word of God to him so I'm not going to belabor that we're going to stop right there we're going to move to point number three starting in, in verse three chapter two verse three point three and when they broken through and when they broken through then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. How many? One at each corner. They brought to him a paralytic, carried by four men, when they could not come near him because of the crowd. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to get near Christ. When they could not get near him, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get near. They're trying to get near to Christ. They uncovered the roof where he was. Now, why could they not get there? Look at verse 6. Look who's filling up the room. Verse 6. Some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts. Who's filling up the house? The scribes and the Pharisees. The place is just filled up with Pharisees. The other people that needed Christ couldn't get there. Well, these Pharisees need him too. They didn't want him. Who's filling the place up? The Pharisees. When they could not get near Jesus because of the crowd of the Pharisees. They were reasoning in their hearts. Who, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, that's true. And you're going to see it. Go back with me to verse 4. When they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, and so when they had broken through, when they had broken through. Okay, now we need to look at three things this morning right quick. The reason they couldn't get near him, the reason they couldn't break through is because, number one, the Pharisees. They just don't believe in the power of God. They don't believe in the power of prayer, and they didn't believe in Christ. Now, it's crazy what we're talking about unless you see it. It's crazy to believe, or it seems crazy, to believe that you can ask God to do something and you not do anything and Him fix it. That seems nuts, doesn't it? Talking to an invisible God and asking our Father to do something and we can't do anything and we ask Him to fix it and He does? A leper walks up to Him and nobody, nobody would touch a leper wouldn't even get close to a leper. And this guy gets up close to him and says, Could you heal me? Would you heal me? Jesus said, Come here. He reached out and he touched him, and he was just completely well. There was no mumbo-jumbo. There was just an answer to prayer. Now that seems nuts until you see it. Here's Peter's mother-in-law, and she's sick. She's got a real high fever, and they said, Could you... Could you heal her? And he just reached down very lovingly and just pulled her right back up off the couch. And when she got up, she felt really good. And she went, just like what every single woman in, in Judaism did, she went in and cooked. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm good with that. Every, every good mama in America cook. In Texas, you can cook steak. It's cheaper than hamburgers. Chocolate, almost like manna, biblical. 
And what did she do? She went in there, and what did she do for Jesus? She ministered to Jesus. Went in there and cooked for him. Hallelujah. First thing, when I get to heaven, I get to sit down at the table. Did you hear that? For a thousand years. <laughs> and the angels are going to be serving. I'll take some more, please. Pharisees, what else I want you to see? This is a picture of the church. This is a picture of Israel paralyzed. Laying on the bed, on the mattress. The word actually is mattress. Laying on the mattress, paralyzed. That is the picture of Israel in Jesus' day. Completely paralyzed. church, the synagogue, and the temple had become eaten up with the physical, eaten up with things, eaten up with money. The priesthood had to buy the priesthood. It was no longer a calling of God, it was bought. In Revelations, the last church age, Jesus comes to him and he says, you are lukewarm. You say you're rich and you have need of nothing. This is the church of the Lord Jesus today, completely paralyzed. Laying on the bed, nothing going on, paralyzed. Good for nothing. This guy just could not do anything. But there were four men. There were four friends. Four in the Bible is a picture of north, south, east, and west. Totality. There were four men, one at each corner, that wanted desperately, they desperately wanted to see him healed. This is a desperate desire to see the church healed. To see the church unparalyzed. And these four guys believed that Jesus could do that. The church wasn't getting near to Christ. They couldn't get near to Christ because of all the false teachers and all the false prophets and all the Pharisees. But there's four guys that have a desperate desire. One, two, three, four. That's not many, but you count them. They had a desperate desire to see this thing healed, to see the church healed, to see this man healed. And so what do they do? They go in verse 4. When they could not get him near to Christ, when they could not get the church near to Christ, They'd done everything that they could. They preached as much as they could preach. They taught as much as they could teach. They had witnessed as much as they could witness. And nothing was getting them close to Christ. The church was not getting healed. And there was no way they could get him to Christ. There was no way that the church could get to Christ. What did they decide to do? Decided to go up top. That's where we need to go. We need to go up top. And it took some effort. But when they had broken through, look at this the end of verse 4. They let down the, the mattress on which the paralytic was lying, and when Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? Those four guys and that paralytic. When he saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. The United States of America needs a spiritual awakening. People need saved. They need their sins forgiven. We have horrible sins, and we know it, and they know it. I've got horrible sins. They've got horrible sins. We know it. They know it. There's no way that they're ever going to get to Christ or to heaven because they know what they've done. You can't do enough good works to undo what they've done. And this, they knew this. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the scribes are sitting there reasoning in their hearts saying, this guy's speaking blasphemies. Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. Immediately when Jesus perceived in his heart, his spirit that they reasoned thus, then themselves he said to them why do you reason about these things in your hearts which is easier to say to the paralytic your sins are forgiven or arise take up your bed and walk but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic I say to you arise take your bed and go home and he was physically healed you're going to see a physical healing in the United States you're going to see that but I want you to know that it's God when it happens, I want you to know it's God. And there's going to be one other thing you need to know when you see it. Our sins can be forgiven. 
this nation is not so wicked that Jesus Christ cannot save us. Do you remember Nineveh? God told Jonah, I said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I hate them with a perfect hatred. Those rioters cannot be saved. This nation is lost. It's gone too far. It cannot be saved. Oh, yes, it can. And it will be if we go up on top and we break through. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take effort. And we're going to have to do something about it. We're going to have to learn how to break through in prayer. Have you prayed all night? Have you prayed it through? Till the morning light, till the dew. We've got to learn how to pray. Now, what brought him near to Jesus was their prayers. As they went up on top and they broke through. And it is possible for us to do the same thing. Would you play that video? There was a great revival in the Hebrides in the early 1900s. Began to move, moved up to the pleading for it into the 40s. Maybe we could say it topped out in the early 50s. Two old women, one was 84 years old and one was 82 years old. One was blind and one was humped over so badly with spinal stenosis, just, just arched over. But they had passion for revival. They wanted God to work. This, this is what happened. They couldn't even get out to the church to pray. They couldn't even get out to the church to worship. Their house became a place to meet. People came in. They got so passionate about revival coming to the, their isle, the Isle of Lewis. They got so passionate about it. They confronted the preacher and wanted to know if he was thoroughly right with God. <laughs> and they prayed and prayed and prayed. And they'd seen the Lord, they said, with the church filled up and God blessing and a great overflow. And the fire of God struck that tiny little obscure place off the coast of Scotland. And when it happened, there was a young teenage boy that got saved in it. His name was Donald. And the preacher became so dependent upon Donald and so close to Donald, he would ask him to lead in public prayers and help him with the meetings, and he did. Oh, how God worked. People began to hear about it, and the revival fire spread. It spread. God blessed in a, in a great way. Those two old women, the people, kind of people, people don't want in their church anymore. And from that same island, there was a, a young girl who was a cousin to Donald Smith, who immigrated to America. Her name was Marianne Smith McLeod. She came to America and in 1936. She met a man named Fred. And they were married. They fell in love. They were married. God blessed in a great way. And those old women were her aunts. And they came out of that fiery revival, that fiery revival. They really experienced revival. And they sent a Bible copy of the Word of God that had been used in a special way in that revival to Mary Ann. She started having children. I think it was 1937, she had her first child. They named him after his father, Fred. Then she had her second child named after herself, Mary Ann. Then she had her third child, Elizabeth. Then she had her fourth child, she was so impacted by this teenage boy God had used in that revival of the Hebrides. She named him Donald. And she gave him that Bible, the Hebrides Revival Bible. He was born in 1946. He's now the 45th president of the United States. And that revival Bible is in the Oval Office. 
I'm saying to you, I don't know how, why, I don't know how it all comes together. But I, but I believe God is putting some things together. In the White House, on the desk, from the Hebrides Revival, I checked out all the facts before I presented this to you. Everything that he said is true. That's the president of Crown College in Tennessee. Now, prayer works. And what I'm going to ask us to do today, I'm going to ask these people I've talked to, uh, if you'll come, Kay, if you'll come, uh, Caleb, Rick, Jerry. Uh, Adele is going to be one of those, but she's <laughs> been around COVID and they wouldn't let her come today, of course. Guys, get your, get your signs and just hold them up in front. We're going to do something in this church. I'm going to ask you to do it. It's not anything weird. We're going to pray. And I, I know that you're used to doing that, but I, I'm going to start, we're going to try to start five groups of prayer, and it's going to be very, very specific prayer. We're not going to get together and just pray. I'm going to ask you to pray on Wednesday night. I'm going to preach on Wednesday night. I'm going to try not to steal your time. So uh, on Wednesday night, we have a service from 6.30 to 7.30. Well, I'm going to stop speaking at 7 o'clock. So from 6.30 to 7, I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach the Word of God. We're on Revelation, by the way. But then from 7 to 7.30, I'm asking this church if you would come here and pray, except for this guy right here who's already got one going, and he's got them praying on Sunday morning uh, out in the prayer house while I'm preaching. He, they're praying for you, and they're praying for me, and they're praying for the staff. This is a staff church service. We've got one group that's going to be for political leaders. We're going to pray specifically. The Bible says to pray for your leaders. And we're going to do that. We're going to pray for our Texas leaders. We're going to pray for our national leaders. We're going to pray for the Supreme Court. We're going to pray for our Congress. Instead of grappling, we're going to pray. Uh, first responders, this is our, our police, this is our sheriffs, this is our fire department. Uh, we're going to be praying for them specifically. Revival and spiritual awakening in the state, in the city, in the nation, we're going to pray very specifically about some of that that's going on. I have access to some of the political bills that are coming before the state and before the nation. For instance, and we missed this one. We didn't even see it coming. Uh, the state of Texas, for the first time in the education board, for the very first time in history, has decided to allow the teaching of homosexuality in its health classes. Now, the, the, cl the school districts are not required to do that, but if they so choose, it's now legal to do it. It was not legal, and that got past us. We didn't even know it to start this year in Texas. This is going to be some of the stuff we pray about. Revival in the church, spiritual awakening in the nation. Let's see, Adele's is for children. That's going to include schools. Well, the school, we definitely need to pray about what the schools are going to do. Uh, the CPS thing, I've been holding that in front of you on the bulletin. That's going to be part of this. Abortion, we're going to pray that God puts a stop to this. And this particular group, I'll be standing right here. I'm Adele. We've got uh, five yellow sheets over here and as you leave today if you want to and I'm letting you do it as you leave because I don't want to draw attention to anybody that doesn't feel like they can do that you don't have to pray out loud when you come to do this group if you're out on the parking lot I told you just a minute ago uh, if you don't want to be physically in the group if you'll call the church office and tell me which group we're going to be in I will tell you uh, what you need to pray for and you can call me every week and you can be part of this even though you're not physically there you guys are physically here. We need some prayer. We're going to, me and the deacons, and I've talked to some of you deacons about this, but I haven't had a chance to talk to all of you deacons about it, but while they're praying from 7 to 7.30, me and the deacons are going to be praying in a special group. And we're going to be praying for some things I'm not going to ask you to pray for. We're going to be praying some hard things. We're going to be praying some imprecatory prayer things. We're going to be doing some spiritual warfare praying, me and the deacons, for 30 minutes once a week. And I'm asking you if you would pick out one of these. And the, the fifth one is the children and the schools and the CPS. Now listen, this CPS thing that's coming down in Texas is going to affect, it's coming down to Amarillo, it's going to affect Texas, and it will affect the United States. And if we can get in the baseline of this and start praying about it right now, there will be a lot, a lot, a lot of children saved. 
but we've got to pray about this. And I'm asking you, if you would sign up for one of these groups, it's 30 minutes a week. And, of course, everybody goes on vacation. Everybody gets sick. I'm not asking you to, to show up on those days. Just when you can, these are the, going to be the leaders of the groups. Uh, for instance, one of our policemen got ambushed the other day. He got shot with a cannon uh, on the 4th of July, and he, he was in the hospital. Well, we're going to do something about that. When we, every time we pray, we're going to sign a card, and we're going to send it to somebody. We're going to send it to him. I've got uh, gift cards on my desk. Uh, they're about to have a big, we support the blue thing in one of the parks, and they draw numbers, and the policemen get to pick a, a gift card or something, and they've asked people to uh, donate some of these. I've got a whole handful of them on my desk. We're going to go do that. This group, which group is it? Right here. We're going to get actively involved in that. That policeman that got hurt, we're going to send his family a couple of gift cards because they can go out and eat, and we're going to give them a prayer card that says, we love you. We're going to do it this week. We're going to get involved in what's going on around here. We're not going to be marching. We're not going to be attacking. We're going to be praying. But in our prayers, we're going to be exhorting. This is an ex exhortation ministry. We're going to send these people that we prayed for cards. We're not going to send a card that says, we prayed for you and we hope you die. We're going to send them a card that says, we are praying for you because Jesus told us to pray for you, and we're going to send it out. And, and when we can send out gift cards to encourage like this family, this policeman's family or these, these firemen's families, we're going to do that. We're going to get involved. I'm going to spend some of your hard-earned money. We're not just paying for the CPS house anymore. Let's put it to good use. And so I'm asking you, as we leave today, if you'll sign up for one of these. What did I do with that other thing? Where's that children's thing? Oh, you're, you're, there it is, right there, okay. You know what I mean. We're going to get involved if you want to. Okay, now we've got to go. I told you if there was somebody here that needed to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He is God. He is the Son of God. And that cross that's up there, that they want to tear down all across the United States, that cross right there, it means something. It means something. It means that God died on the cross to unite me and the Father together. And my sins can be forgiven forever and ever and ever. But you have to do something. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, you believe right here, but you receive right here. And you ask him, there's a point at which you ask him, would you forgive me of my sins? And here's how Jesus said it. You must be born again. Have you always been here, or was there a point at which you got born? And that's what Jesus is telling you. There's a point at which you get born again. And that point is when you ask Christ to forgive all your sins, to come and live inside of you, turn your life over to him forever he'll take it from there if you would like to do that as these people are leaving as these people are signing up I'm going to be over here I'm the sixth person right over here you come and talk to me and I'll help you and I'll tell you how to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior Christianity's real and it means something it means something that cross means something and there's they're wanting to tear that down. We're going to get involved in this. We're going to ask God to fix it. We're going to ask God to save them. We're going to ask God to save our nation. And I've said enough. Stand, please.